Um, hello, everyone, those that have joined so far. Um, my name is Rebecca, and I work at LCC in admissions office. And today I will be um, the host or the moderator for this LCC Academy Today's lecture. And um, let me introduce Sara. Snodgrass. Um, she is um, at LCC, works as a director of partnerships and student care for study abroad Lithuania at LCC International University. Um, right, so um, let me go ahead and share my screen to do a little presentation about LCC University before the lecture begins. Okay. Right, so LCC International University is the only North American style university in, in this region, in the immediate region, um, in the Baltic um, states and Eastern Europe as well. Here we go, um, better, better perspective of where we are located. Lithuania, Klaipeda city. Um, Klaipeda is right on the Baltic shore um, and LCC campus is literally, I would say about um, 20 minutes, maybe 25 at most of working from Baltic Sea. Um, very small, calm, um, student friendly um, city, I would say. Um, and here are some pictures of the old town that we have. And also on the beach, you can see some of our students as well. LCC has a fully residential campus, which means that um, the sports center, the um, living facilities, housing, and the main building where the studies happen are all in, in one place. And um, these pictures are more or less can show all the big buildings that we have. All right, well, the educational model um, that LCC has is, is North American style of um, university. And if you can think of um, universities, most of the universities in the United States or maybe even Canada, um, those would have um, this similar style of, of education, liberal arts educational model. Um, and some of you I'm sure have heard of this term. Um, basically it means broad based education. And um, we have several uh, bachelor programs that LCC offered for our students and um, our students even though they choose one major to study, they will have an opportunity to take courses from other programs as well um, and combine them however they want, um, which allows them and gives them more opportunities after graduation to find a job or maybe to um, go for further studies for master's degree as well. We are international as, as LCC University's name stand um, and the numbers speak to themselves. We 73% of student body are international um, students at LCC and they all come from more than 50 countries um, from almost all continents. Um, yeah, and we are also a Christian university, which means that um, we have the Christian values in the worldview as well. However, I would like to mention that because we're international university, we have students with various religious backgrounds and we welcome everyone and we tolerate all our students and their religions as well. Um, LCC education and LCC diploma is accredited in European Union, in Lithuania as well which is recognized worldwide. So basically, if you study at LCC and you get our diploma, you will be able to work anywhere. And the last one is relational. Um, at LCC, we do give a lot of attention to not only um, in the classroom academic relationship, but also outside of the classroom, we build our community. We call it um, our own family and our professors as well. They invest a lot of time in getting to know their um, students and um, helping them and supporting them in any way that they can. Right, okay, so let's move to our next slide, academic programs. We have six bachelor programs. As you can see on the screen, um, those are business, contemporary communications, English um, language and literature, international relations, psychology, and theology. Um, all of them are um, studies all in English, we are American University. Um, all of them are four years of studies as well. And um, as I have mentioned, um, you know, even if you choose one of these, majors, you will still have an opportunity to, um, you know, take a look and or have a glimpse 
of um, courses from other programs as well as a general elective for your um, academic progress. Okay, we also have master's um, level, two master's programs, MA in International Management and MA in TESOL, Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. Both of them are two years of studies um, and all of the prices and the application process, the admissions and requirements and everything you can find on um, LCC website. And um, if you will have an interest or you have questions um, on the website as well, there will be an um, email where you can send all of your questions. Okay, well, today's lecture is by Sara Snutgrass, Battling Against Human Trafficking, How to Actually Help Not Hurt Communities at Risk. And I'm sure you have already seen um, this advertisement, this um, um, banner um, before preparing for this lecture. And um, in this lecture, uh, we will explore the world of global NGOs and how they are engaging in anti-slavery work. Um, we will also look at cycles of poverty, what circumstances lead to forced labor and sex slavery and how we can be active participants in ending this abhorrent practices as well. So um, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, this lecture is um, entitled Battling Human Trafficking, How to Help and Not Hurt Communities at Risk. Um, so just by way of uh, a little bit of a disclaimer, um, this topic can be um, quite difficult and upsetting to some. Um, and so I just want to um, say that I'll do, I do my best when I talk about this topic to be sensitive, um, but I do kind of want to give that disclaimer up front. Um, just by way of a brief introduction, I started working in the nonprofit sector in 2010 and have continued to be involved uh, with various organizations, working with vulnerable communities um, since that time. Um, so I wish we had more time together than just 40 minutes because there's so much we can talk about uh, in this topic is, um, you know, it's broad. There are so many different facets. I'll do my best to keep us on track, um, kind of keep things together. And then at the end, uh, I'll give some suggestions about how to be personally involved and how to help the anti-trafficking movement and cause um, and not actively hurt co uh, communities at risk, um, vulnerable communities. Um, so. To begin, I'll start with a um, kind of a definition of human trafficking. Um, so human trafficking involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain some type of labor or commercial sex act. Um, slavery, as I mentioned in my little preview video, um, modern day slavery is what happens when a trafficked person arrives at their destination. Um, so no, country is immune from human trafficking. This unfortunately happens in um, kind of every pocket, uh, every place in the world. Um, and uh, there are three different kind of types of, um, of trafficking that happens in each country. So you might be a source country, a transit destination, uh, or a, a transit country or a destination country. Um, a source country is a, a country that actually serves as um, a place where trafficking begins and people are taken out of. Um, transit countries are um, literally countries where people are taken through, depending on the geography of that country. Um, and a destination country is where a person ends up. So a country may be one of these things, maybe two of these things, maybe all of these things. Um, I'll say from my experience as uh, an American citizen, uh, this that the US is all three of these. Um, it's a source, a transit and a destination country. Um, so victims of human trafficking are forced into prostitution or forced labor. People often work in brick kilns. This is really common um, in uh, certain parts of Asia, sweatshops, um, which happens all over the world. Um, farms, people are trafficked for domestic help as child soldiers. Um, and many other forms of involuntary servitude. Um, traffickers often target children and young women, and they routinely trick their victims with promises of employment, educational opportunities, marriage, or better life. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so the question is, how many people are victims of trafficking? 
It's difficult to know exactly how many people are affected because so many cases go undetected and reported, but um, it is estimated that between 600,000 and 800,000 women, men, and children are trafficked across international borders every year. And then according to the Global Slavery Index, it's estimated that more than 40 million people are trapped in slavery today worldwide. Um, so this is a huge, huge problem. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of when we hear those numbers, it just seems like this is an insurmountable problem to tackle. Um, I am so encouraged by knowing that there are thousands of organizations that are working um, to end human trafficking and uh, modern day slavery. Um, and my hope is that we can all be a part of um, being a, a benefit to this work. Um, it's estimated that about 71% of modern day slaves are women and girls, and then the remaining 29-30% are um, men and boys. Um, the average age of girls who are trafficked for work in the sex industry is about 12 to 14 years old. Um, I'll say that this kind of depends a little bit on where, where we're talking about. Um, we found, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but I worked um, for some time in Nepal, working in the anti-trafficking, uh, for an anti-trafficking organization. We found that the girls that we were um, talking with who were being trafficked were a little bit older, maybe um, 15 to 17 years old, um, but they can be as young as five or six, um, and then into their uh, early 20s, even into mid 30s. Um, so the range is really quite wide, um, but globally, the average age is 12 to 14. Um, so another question is, is trafficking a lucrative business? The answer shortly is yes, it's extremely lucrative. Um, trafficking in people is the third most profitable criminal activity behind women, uh, but behind drug and weapon trafficking. And it's estimated that human trafficking trade generates nearly $150 billion US dollars, that's billion with a B, every year. Um, so uh, you know, this is a hugely profitable, um, which makes it incredibly difficult to fight against because there's so much money that's involved. Um, a little bit of a breakdown, so you can see the numbers here. 99 billion come from commercial sex sexual exploitation, 34 billion in construction, manufacturing, mining, and utilities. So that would be forced labor. Um, also forced labor, 9 billion in agriculture. Um, so that's farming, um, forestry, and fishing. And then 8 billion is saved um, annually by private households employing domestic workers under conditions of forced labor. So you have kind of both sides of you have money making and you have money saving. And so those two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, so the question you know, then is why does this happen? Um, you know, not only is it you know, lucrative, um, but how does it start? How, do, you know, how does it really begin? So I'm gonna talk about um, push factors and pull factors. These are really important kind of key terms when we're talking about trafficking. And so, um, you know, if you're taking notes or uh, if there are kind of some key things that you wanna write down, uh, push factors and pull factors are really important um, to be aware of. So push factors are things that literally, you know, push people out um, and the reason why it kind of starts. So um, this would be um, poverty, oppression, lack of human, basic human rights, lack of social or economic opportunities, um, dangers from conflict or instability, um, political instability, militarism, civil unrest, uh, internal armed conflict and natural disasters. All of these may result in an increase in trafficking. Um, also the destabilization and displacement, displacement of populations um, increases vulnerability um, of people to be exploited and abused through trafficking and forced labor. Um, so war and civil strife uh, is really a big problem and a reason why people are pushed to leave their communities. Um, again, I mentioned Nepal and I'll talk about this more in depth in a little bit, but um, there was a civil war in Nepal back in the early 2000s. This left thousands of children um, orphaned and so therefore vulnerable, nobody to take care of them. That vacuum doesn't get left um, kind of uh, unfilled. And so people will come in and take advantage of these kids. So um, specifically orphans and kids who live on the street are extremely vulnerable to trafficking. 
So those are push factors. The other side of this is pull factors. So things that pull people um, away from their homes. Um, so sex tourism um, is a, a big one. Um, again, you know, trafficking happens everywhere. And I would say, you know, sex tourism happens um, in probably al almost every country as well. Um, but in the US, for example, uh, not only is it illegal, uh, but it's also expensive. Um, and so the US is not a huge des destination for other people to come for sex tourism. Um, but places in Southeast Asia, like Cambodia, which I'll talk about a little bit more shortly, um, is a huge draw because uh, although it's a it is illegal um, in Cambodia. Um, it's overlooked to not really enforce, and it's also extremely inexpensive. Um, so that's a big pull factor. Um, and then the promise of a better life um, to vulnerable people uh, who have very little opportunities, um, the promise of an education, the promise of a marriage, uh, the promise of a job. These are all pull factors, um, reasons why people might leave their homes. These two things really go hand in hand. Um, there is no push without pull. Um, and so, you know, there are reasons why people leave, people, the reasons why people are vulnerable. Um, and then there is a market on the other hand. And so these two things really go together uh, and they work hand in hand. Um, so it's really important to, to see both um, and to address both push and pull factors. So um, I want to give you kind of an introduction um, to my own experience and how I got kind of uh, introduced into this, um, this world of um, anti-trafficking. Um, so I mentioned Cambodia before. Um, South and South Southeast Asia are infamous for sex tourism. Um, and so I was a recent college grad. Uh, so many of you are kind of in this season of life of kind of figuring out what you're gonna be doing after you graduate and, uh, or as you even come into college and thinking about what the next, uh, you know, four to six years hold for you. Um, so I had just graduated from college. Um, I was working at, as an assistant actually for a nonprofit that gave grants to organizations who are working with women and children at risk. And so there was an organization that we were working with in Cambodia that was specifically focusing on rescuing young girls who are being used as sex slaves in Phnom Penh, which is the capital of Cambodia. Um, and I had really never been exposed to this issue before. Um, and I just remember thinking that I couldn't even believe that this was happening in our kind of modern world. I grew up in a, a fairly sheltered environment um, and it was you know, safe. And so the, the fact that young girls were being exposed um, to such a terrible, terrible reality um, really was shocking to me. Um, Cambodia specifically, um, if you're not familiar with where it's located, it's in Southeast Asia. So kind of geographically, it's um, in a place where people are kind of vulnerable. It's close to other places. Um, so it's close to Thailand, it's close to Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> it has a population of about 15 million. Um, and it's estimated that 26% uh, of the adult population is illiterate. 18% of the population live below the international poverty line, which is one, uh, about one US dollar a day. Um, children in Cambodia um, have a really um, a huge disadvantage. 30%, 36% of children are working already as uh, child laborers. Um, and about 30% of children are receiving inadequate care on a daily basis. Um, so Cambodia, um, the population of Cambodia is really quite vulnerable. Um, it is a source country, so people are being trafficked out of it because uh, there are so little opportunities there. And as I mentioned, geographically, because of where it's situated between Thailand, which has more resources, Thailand's a huge destination for sex tourism. Um, so it's a transit country, um, you, know, you know, maybe girls, uh, and I'll say, be saying girls, it happens more frequently with girls, but as I mentioned before, uh, you know, 30% are men and, and boys, but for sex uh, trafficking specifically, it's mostly women. Um, so, you know, a woman may be trafficked, being trafficked from Vietnam into Thailand. Um, so it is a transit country and then it is a destination country um, for human trafficking as well. So this is my introduction um, to, to the issue. Um, and I was really, um, uh, as I said, kind of heartbroken by it, but also really inspired uh, by the work that was happening, um, the really brave and courageous work that was happening uh, by these organizations who are working to, um, to protect and rescue these young girls. Um, and so that was really what inspired me to kind of step into wanting to be more of a part of, um, uh, of battling this, this huge problem. Um, 
so soon after that experience of learning about um, Cambodia, I had the opportunity to travel to India. Um, and so during that trip, I went to Mumbai, um, which is uh, really a, fasc a fascinating city. There's about 18 million people who live in Mumbai. Um, some of the richest people in the world, billionaires live in this city. Um, but it also, uh, when I was there, you know, you kind of see the juxtaposition between um, the mega wealthy and uh, the kind of the abject poverty. And so again, as a young person, a recent college graduate, having to kind of wrestle through the, that juxtaposition of, um, you know, how do those two things exist side by side where you have these, you know, man mansions and then you have, um, you know, shacks right next door. Um, and so Mumbai has a very, uh, famous, infamous, however you want to say, um, red light district. Um, so it's estimated that there are over 100,000 sex workers in Mumbai alone. Um, so, you know, kind of as I was there and I was walking down the streets, you know, it's, uh, kind of dirt roads and, uh, narrow streets and, um, as you can see in this picture, women just kind of hang out outside um, waiting for their next clients. There are bars on the windows. Um, inside it's dank and dark. Uh, it's really kind of terrible, terrible place. Um, I was also during my time in Mumbai working with an organization um, or spent some time with an organization who worked with kids um, of women who are in the sex industry um, because often if the kids don't have any place to go, they'll be in the room while their mothers work. Um, so not only are these kids extremely vulnerable um, to you know, men who are violent, drunk, you know, any number of things where the kids could be um, taken advantage of, but um, beyond that, just you know, thinking about a, a child you know, hiding under a bed um, while their uh, mom is working is just, it's no place for a child to be. Um, so this is a huge, huge issue in Mumbai. Um, I will say kind of as an aside, COVID has changed this a little bit. Um, and the results of that kind of remain to be seen. Um, so I won't get into that too much, um, because this is kind of an ongoing, um, an ongoing change. Um, but, you know, after my time in Mumbai, in Cambodia, I had been reading about it and hearing about it. Um, and in Mumbai, I saw it with my own eyes. And so this was really, um, kind of a life-changing time for me where I felt like, you know, these are images that are burned in my mind. Um, women that I talk to who are, you know, being raped multiple times a day, no hope in sight. Um, you know, after you kind of had that experience, I you just couldn't go back to living this kind of normal life anymore. Um, so I felt like I needed to be involved in a significant way, uh, no matter how far away from home that that took me. Um, so this is what led me to Nepal. Um, and I'll show you a map in a little bit of where this is, but it's a, a tiny country that's sandwiched between China to the north and India to the south. Um, I wasn't looking necessarily to work specifically in Nepal. I was more interested in just the issue itself. And so kind of willing to go wherever that took me, but it took me to Nepal. And, uh, so Nepal is a really unique place. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, um, but it is in between these two superpowers of China and India. Um, uh, children are trafficked within the country, um, but more often they're trafficked um, into India and also to the Gulf countries. So, you know, Dubai, uh, Qatar, um, Bahrain uh, is a, also a place where girls are trafficked more for um, forced labor than for um, sexual exploitation. Um, but the Indian... Um, sex industry is huge. Um, and so this is a big problem for Nepalis. Um, so it's estimated between 12,000 and 15,000 girls between ages um, six to 16 are trafficked each year from Nepal into India. Um, more than 250,000 uh, Nepali girls are forced into the Indian sex trade, where, as I mentioned, um, prostitution is legal. Um, and up to 7,000 girls from rural areas are um, brought as domestic slaves into Kathmandu, which is the capital um, where sexual abuse is common. Um, and more than 100,000 children are being forced to leave their villages and 10,000 children are being orphaned as a result of the 12 year long civil war that I mentioned in Nepal. Um, so this is a, a huge, huge problem in Nepal. Um, so I worked for an organization um, called Love Justice International. Um, this is how I kind of got uh, hooked up with this um, uh, work, being able to, to go to Nepal and work. Um, 
and it was a big, uh, kind of a big change for me. Nepal is very different culturally than the U.S. Um, I was learning a lot kind of on my feet and learning about the problems and the issues. Um, as a Westerner, not speaking the language, um, kind of was a big learning curve. Um, but it was, um, the organization was started as a children's home organization to begin with. Um, because of the civil war that happened in Nepal, so many kids were left orphaned. Um, and so this organi organization started um, with small children's homes, bringing in kids who were orphaned, um, giving them a safe place to grow up. Um, and so these were children's homes. The point was not to, um, to get them adopted out as a place where they could to grow up and be part of a family in Nepal. So Nepali house parents. Um, and so it was really amazing as I was able to be in Nepal to get to know these kids and see them um, be safe um, where they had been so vulnerable in the past. Um, and were certainly the kind of um, in the kind of situations where they would be vulnerable to be trafficked, that they were then in, in a home where they could grow up safely. Um, I won't go too off too far off my um, my topic of trafficking specifically to talk about um, orphanages and children's homes, um, but I think kind of in the world of orphanages um, around the world, um, I've spent some time in Ukraine. Um, at some orphanages there um, and have lots of friends who have worked at uh, different orphanages and children's homes around the world. Um, orphanages are places that are um, a perfect place for abuse to happen. There's often very little oversight. Um, there's often a lot of foreign money that comes in um, to orphanages. And so um, also with um, kind of the prevalence of short-term volunteers coming from various places around the world, um, well-meaning volunteers, um, this is always an area uh, thinking about orphans who are already very vulnerable um, of kind of the idea of helping and not hurting. Um, I'm, I'm pretty strongly against um, volunteering for short periods of time in orphanages. Um, you know, kids who come from these backgrounds where they don't have um, stability get pretty attached um, to volunteers who come, who give them, um, give them clothing, give them toys, give them love. Um, hold them. Um, the problem is, is that people come in, give them those things and then leave. And then there's this cycle that happens of people coming, um, loving and leaving. And this can lead um, orphans to be very cynical, um, to have kind of um, attachment disorders. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, I mean, you may be actually meaning well by visiting and volunteering in orphanages, but maybe actually harming those communities that you are um, trying to help. And so um, as someone, I worked uh, at a at Gordon College in Boston for several years um, and volunteered, uh, led multiple teams volunteering around the world. Um, we almost never did any kind of um, orphan ministry or volunteering because of this issue. Um, when I was working with volunteers in Nepal and thinking about our own children's homes, um, I would usually bring our teams um, to one children's home one time for maybe an hour or two. Um, and so there was an opportunity for some, uh, you know, uh, interaction um, for the kids to have a fun afternoon, um, but not opportunity to get too attached to the volunteers. Um, so I would say as a word of caution, um, for those of you who may be interested in, um, kind of being involved in the lives of orphans. And I think, you know, especially coming from a Christian worldview, um, from a biblical standpoint, we're told and, and um, it's pretty explicit they're supposed to care for orphans. Um, I think there's a way to do that that's uh, appropriate and helpful for kids who are vulnerable. Um, and so being really thoughtful about um, long-term, kind of thinking about the long-term um, the overall picture of a, of a kid's life rather than short-term, um, short-term is easier for us. Um, typically, you know, we may have one or two weeks to, to give and volunteer. Um, and so we think, you know, for us, it's a great opportunity, but thinking on the other side, these kids, um, are in these orphanages for potentially their whole lives. Um, and so thinking about the long-term effects is really important. So, um, you know, for me, working with the orphanage that I work, um, that I've volunteered at in Ukraine. It's a commitment that I have. Um, COVID has made this difficult in the past year, but um, to con continue to go back um, and to con continue to invest in the relationships that I've built um, with that community in Ukraine um, and how important that is that I continue to show my face, to continue to be involved in lives. Um, also, you know, my own um, giving, my own financial giving, giving to 
uh, the same places uh, over a period of time. So there's a relationship that's built. Um, so this is a little bit of a soapbox for me, um, short-term orphan care. Uh, so I, I won't um, harp on that too much. Um, but uh, just thinking of, again about how are we helping these communities and not harming them, um, I think short-term orphan care can be very damaging. Um, okay, so back to um, back to the organization that I've worked for um, in Nepal, and so it, it went from a children's home ministry and it expanded into this anti-trafficking work that it still does to this day and really has expanded um, greatly in the last several years into uh, other parts of the world besides just Nepal. Um, so as I mentioned, Nepal is the source country so um, for trafficking. So girls are taken out of Nepal and trafficked into India. And so, um, you know, every stage along a girl's journey, um, when it comes uh, to them ending up um, in, in modern day slavery in a place like India is important. So we have to kind of address every part. So there are some organizations that are working on doing education um, in villages, uh, teaching villages, teaching communities about the dangers of trafficking. The challenge with this in a place like Nepal um, is the terrain is um, very mountainous. We have the Himalayan mountains, but also the foothills, which are huge. Um, and so even getting to these, these communities, these little villages um, is uh, nearly impossible to reach them all. Um, and so the education piece is a challenge in and of itself. Um, and then you have kind of the other side, the brothel raids, shutting down brothels, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and kind of the challenge there. And so the organization that I worked for decided that the, um, the best use of its resources were to focus on transit monitoring and border monitoring. Um, so um, I'm gonna pull up this map here so you can see. Um, Nepal, as I mentioned, is, is sandwiched between you have China to the north and India to the south. So you'll see that border um, that it's about an 1100 mile border. Um, and this is where the organization started setting up um, border monitoring stations. So all along the India-Nepal border, there on that southern border, there were little stations at the border crossings um, where we started to put um, our staff so they could actually do interceptions of people as they're being taken across the border. Um, also not just at the border station, so literally at the physical border, but there are also um, bus stations that are you know, in town. And so girls would come from these villages and I'll explain a, a, a little bit um, about kind of how this happens specifically, but the girls would come to these bus stations, either in a bus or a taxi, um, and then would walk across the border. And so this is kind of an innovative um, strategy to intercept girls um, in transit or at the border um, and kind of stop the problem before the girl is exploited. Um, and so this has provided a really good um, impact for the investment, um, focusing on the trafficking as it is occurring um, and creating uh, what would otherwise be kind of rare opportunities for engagement. This is also an opportunity to collect information. Um, one of the most challenging things, um, and I won't get into this too much because uh, it's kind of another topic in and of itself, but the conviction rate for traffickers is very, very small. It's incredibly difficult um, to prosecute um, or even find. Um, there's various reasons for this. Um, one reason is that often people who are caught are either mid-level traffickers or they're kind of a nobody from the town that was paid a couple bucks to walk across the border. So they're kind of uh, of no consequence. Another reason is that they're, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, that this is a multi-billion dollar industry. So um, there are the, the people who are kind of the high level people um, have a huge incentive to protect their assets uh, and to protect themselves. And so the trafficker, the traffickers who are really the ones in charge, those are the ones you wanna convict and prosecute. Those people are very difficult to actually find. Um, and so when it actually gets to the, the physical point of taking somebody across the border and trafficking them from one place to another place, um, usually the people who you wanna prosecute are not the people that you catch. Um, and so this is a very challenging thing um, in terms of the transit monitoring. You're not usually intercepting the trafficker that you want that you want to take to prison, um, but we can at least uh, intercept the girl before something really terrible happens to her. Um, so this transit monitoring concept um, has been quite 
uh, effective in Nepal. Um, and not only Love Justice, the organization that I worked for, but other organizations are starting to replicate this model, um, not only in India, um, Bangladesh, which is nearby, uh, but uh, in other parts of the world as well, South Africa, Zambia, lots of um, countries in Africa that, the, that our organization was, is currently working in. Um, the trouble uh, with replicating it exactly is that Nepal and India are unique um, because it's an open border. So um, there's no paperwork that's needed um, to cross the border between Nepal and India if you're from Nepal or India. So um, if I'm Nepali and I'm crossing into India, I might be going there to go shopping um, for various reasons. And so you can kind of come and go. I have a picture here. Um, so this is, there are many um, border crossings, but this is kind of what it looks like. Um, as you see, the, there's a place for cars to go by, rickshaws, um, and then there's just a bridge that goes across. So um, there's nobody checking any kind of paperwork. Um, so it's very easy for people to walk back and forth. Um, and so this poses both a challenge, but also an opportunity for um, us who are working on doing this border monitoring. Um, it's a challenge because, um, you know, there are hundreds of people that pass through this, um, this border crossing every day. Um, as a Westerner, I learned quickly um, that I have not the, I don't have the adequate knowledge to be able to do um, the, the border monitoring myself as much as I wish that I could be on the front lines. Um, it really does take local people. Um, and so this was a huge um, blessing to our organization that we had uh, an amazing Nepali staff who worked tirelessly, worked tirelessly, continue to work tirelessly at the border. Um, they're the ones who not only can tell the difference between a Nepali and an Indian, which um, for me, you know, not having lived there for my whole life, um, that can be challenging in and of itself, um, knowing the difference between who's a Nepali and who's an Indian, um, but also thinking about Nepali is coming from different villages um, and how they might look different depending on, you know, where they're from in Nepal, the dialects that they're speaking. Um, so linguistically, Nepal is very diverse. Um, there are, you know, a hundred different uh, dialects in Nepal. So as a Nepali, you know, if I'm working at, at a, as a border monitor at the, at the border, and I'm listening to what language people are speaking. Um, I can tell if they're speaking Nepali, I can tell if they're speaking a different village dialect. So I can kind of know uh, a little bit about kind of where they're coming from. Um, and then actually stopping um, and questioning girls as they maybe um, are walking across the border to see if they're victims of trafficking. You might be asking, wouldn't it be obvious um, if a girl is being trafficked? It kind of, I think, at least when I was learning about this, the images that came to my mind were, um, you know, forcibly taking people across the border. Uh, wouldn't it be pretty simple to, to identify? Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that traffickers are not dumb um, and they're not going to uh, put themselves in danger uh, unnecessarily. And so um, the trafficker will... All, uh, often send girls ahead of them and say, I'll meet you on the other side, or they'll go across first and say, you know, I'll wait for you come in 20 minutes. Um, and so it's very rare that a trafficker would actually be traveling with a girl. Um, and as I said, you know, there are hundreds of people who are crossing this border every day, going um, back and forth shopping and things. And so um, to be able to identify who may be at risk and who's not is a, is a huge challenge. And so as the organization continues to grow and as more people get uh, into this way of doing um, anti-trafficking work, um, it's being refined in how you talk to people. Um, but it's also important that the workers know how not to infringe upon the, the human rights of migrants. Um, and so what's appropriate questions to ask um, is fairly sensitive. And so that's a challenge. Um, the, you know, the, the benefit of the, the open border is, is that, you know, we can work freely um, those border monitoring stations, people are free to ask questions. Um, and so that's a benefit. Um, often when the border is closed, for example, um, the, Bang the, the Bangladeshi border is a closed border that pushes trafficking underground. Um, traffickers have to be more um, sneaky, I guess you could say, in how they are taking people across the border. Um, and so that can be um, also a challenge in uh, how do you fight against that? You know, you have to think the way the traffickers would think and um, so it can be much more difficult. So the open border um, has allowed the border monitoring to succeed in a lot of ways. <clears throat> and so um, in, in a lot of ways, we hope that this continues to be the situation in which we can um, continue to work. Um, if you've ever heard of um, 
the International Justice Mission, IJM, is probably one of the biggest anti-trafficking organizations in the world. They do um, a lot of these brothel raids. These are the things that make the news. Um, it's exciting. They make movies about this type of thing. Um, you know, the question is why, you know, why can't we just shut down the brothels? Wouldn't that uh, close down uh, the problem? This wouldn't be an issue. Um, and the, the answer is not so simple. So if you think about a supply line, um, and this is a very simple uh, example of a supply line, you have the supplier, which is, you know, if you're thinking about uh, trafficking being maybe an Indian uh, sex trafficking ring who's working out of India, but they're sending their traffickers to Nepal. And this is the supplier. Then you have the trafficker who's the distributor. And then you have the brothels and that's the retailer. So if you shut down the retailer, you shut down the brothels, um, that doesn't actually get to the root problem, um, which is the supplier. Um, and so really you wanna be shutting down the suppliers, um, which as I mentioned before, getting those convictions is very difficult. Um, also, one of the problems with doing brothel raids, so not shutting the brothel down, is that you're creating a space, you're pulling someone out of a brothel only to create a place for a new girl to be trafficked in. Um, and so this is also a huge um, issue. And it's important to kind of think of this not on a, a macro level, but on a micro level of realizing that every person is worth fighting for, every person is important. So the person, the girl that you're taking out of that brothel is a, a human life worth, a, worth uh, you know, having dignity and um, respect. And so it's important that we fight for those people and free those people, but also kind of thinking about it in terms of you are potentially putting someone else at risk. Um, and so uh, this kind of brothel, shutting down brothels, you we have found that as you shut down brothels, a new one pops up next week, uh, maybe even as soon as the next day somewhere else. Um, and so it's this never ending um, kind of cycle. And so the real strategy needs to be to focus on the supplier um, and shutting down the supplier. As I mentioned, every person's um, journey is important um, on, the, on this kind of spectrum from the education to them ending up in a brothel. Um, but we, you know, we need to be smart about how we use our resources. Um, so in case I know that I'm talking fast and we're getting close to the end of our time, um, I do want to show you um, this video and I'll, um, um, so this is a six minute video um, and then I'll wrap up after we finish. Um, I know for me, when I first started learning about this issue that I had kind of a hard time imagining what it really looks like. So this gives, this video gives a, um, a good kind of look into the, the journey. Um, and then I'll talk about, I'll finish, wrap up by um, talking about what can we do. Um, Asia, what I've been talking about seems so far away, but as I mentioned, this kind of thing happens everywhere. So how can we be a part of um, ending this in our lifetime? I have so many emotions right now. I'm so excited. I never thought I would get an opportunity like this to change my life. At the same time, I'm scared. I'm from a small village outside Kathmandu, Nepal. I've never left the area. Now I'm going to leave the country. I love my community, but it's so hard to find a job. And my family is very poor. My father and mother work very hard, but unable to make enough money for our family and to care for my grandparents' medical needs. Now I have a chance to change that. A few weeks ago, a man came to our village offering some girls jobs working at a crossing factory across the border in India. At first, it sounded too good to be true, but he showed us pictures of the factory and the apartments we would be staying in. I will be sharing an apartment with four other women and I will be able to send most of my paycheck home to my family. 
If I can do this even for a few years, it will make a big difference for my family. I have to accept his offer. That was two weeks ago. Yesterday, I packed my bags and said goodbye to my family. They were excited. I was excited too. But there is just so much unknown and unknown. I will miss them. I took a bus to Kathmandu to meet the recruiter and get my bus ticket to the border. Kathmandu is loud, chaotic, and more intense than I had imagined it would be. We purchased my tickets to the border. Today, another man is meeting me at the bus station, who will help me cross the border, and then travel with me into India to the clothing factory. What am I doing? I'm traveling to a country I've never visited for a job that I don't know how to do. That was arranged by a man I just met. Desperation makes you do crazy things. The human trafficking industry is one of the most devastating inhumanities in the world today. Every year, 1.2 million women and children are trafficked. But we're on a mission to change that. At Love Justice International, we work on the front lines in the fight against trafficking every single day. I'm almost at the border and a woman stops me. She separates me from the man who I think is helping me. I'm nervous. I'm confused. She asks me if I know the man I'm with. I say, no, he's a stranger. Then they ask him how he knows me. He says, she's my cousin. This scares me. She tells me stories of girls like me who were tricked and the bad things people did to them. I don't want that to happen to me. She helps me get back home. What if the woman at the border had not been there to stop me? Where would I be right now? So, uh, a little bit of an insight into the journey um, of somebody. Um, I think uh, 
what I want to um, kind of say is that this, um, especially sex trafficking can seem kind of like an out there kind of problem. Um, I, as I said, I wish we had more time because uh, talking about um, forced labor, um, especially in sweatshops, brick, brick kilns, um, farming, uh, there's a whole thing with um, a Nepali migrant workers going to Qatar to work on the, the FIFA stadium. Um, and so many in terrible situations where their passports are taken, they're living in uh, squalor kind of situations. And, um, you know, that, that's a whole other kind of thing that we don't have time to talk about. Um, but it can seem like this kind of overwhelming problem. And so, you know, I'm just one person, what can I do? Um, as I said, kind of thinking about it on a macro level is important because we need to think about how we can use our resources to actually, you know, target these things. Um, but then thinking about it on a micro level of, you know, I'm one person, but the victims, uh, we think about 40 million people, um, but those are individual people. And so thinking about that each life matters. And so even if it's a small step in the right direction, um, that, um, you know, we may not be able to ever see an end of this problem. Um, in fact, I kind of take the view of we probably won't, um, this will be something that, that always happens. I, I, you know, I can't imagine um, there will be a time where people won't be taken advantage of, where people won't be vulnerable, and there will be other people who won't try to take advantage of that. But um, at the same time, thinking that every person matters, um, that we can have an impact on individual people's lives. Um, and so whether that's um, in the sex trafficking or in um, bonded labor, um, thinking about trafficking people who are being taken advantage of. Um, there are certain things that we can do um, to be a part of um, the fight against this. Um, so the first step I would encourage you to take is to educate yourself on the indicators of human trafficking. Um, so if you're you know, going into business, into law enforcement, into education, you may end up being on the front lines of protecting a, a vulnerable person. Um, so educate yourself on what's happening in your community. So then you can keep an eye um, on um, vulnerable people and help protect them. Second is to become an advocate. Um, we live in a world of social media. So use your voice um, to raise awareness or fundraise for an organization that's actively working to fight against trafficking. Um, you know, being, uh, being silent about these um, injustices around the world um, is not how, you know, how we can bring a change to things. And so using our voice, using the platforms that we have in our spheres of influence, um, you may not have a very big following, um, but you do have people that you impact every day, even if that um, group is small. Um, and so, you know, when you educate yourself, share that information with other people. The third is to be a conscientious and informed consumer. Um, this has more to do with um, kind of the bonded labor issue, sweatshops and things. Um, you know, we live in a world where we want things fast, we want things cheap. Um, and the way that that happens um, is by using cheap labor. So fast fashion, um, if you're buying a sweater for two euros, two dollars, um, it most likely was from a worker who was exploited to make it. So um, demand that you, the companies stay accountable for not using sweatshops um, and uh, understand what the economies are in different places and what uh, a living wage is. Um, but don't consume, um, don't consume things that potentially are using um, slave labor. There are um, ways online that you can check your, uh, what I'll call it your slavery footprint. If you Google slavery footprint, you can see kind of what the impact you're having in the world um, based on what you consume. Um, fourth is to volunteer. Um, so there are, as I said, thousands of organizations around the world um, working in this anti-trafficking efforts. Um, so be involved, use your time. Um, you are a student now, and so you may not feel like you have money to financially give. Um, but even if it's a small amount now or thinking about how you invest your money later when you're making more money, um, you know, supporting these efforts um, is so important. Fifth is to become a mentor to a young person who may be vulnerable. Um, so traffickers often target people who are going through a difficult time um, or lack strong support systems. Um, so as a mentor, you can be involved in uh, new and positive experiences in a person's life during a very formative time. Um, so, um, you know, in your community, whether that's getting connected to a school or a church or a nonprofit um, that's working with vulnerable people, um, I would definitely encourage you to become a mentor. Um, and lastly, and this kind of goes back to 
the sex trafficking um, kind of industry and how maybe we're connected more than we think we are, um, that, you know, it seems in some ways like that's a problem that is out there. That's not, I'm not involved in that. Um, but I can't state strongly enough how important it is to not be a consumer of pornography. Um, pornography is a scourge on our society. Um, and uh, more often than not, um, it's using vulnerable women and girls um, to make money. Um, it's you know prevalent, uh, not just in the US where so much of this comes from, but really all around the world. So, you know, girls are being trafficked um, specifically for use in pornography. So if you're a consumer of it, you are part of the problem. Um, and I'll say that again, if you're a consumer of pornography, you are, are a part of the problem. Um, and also what I'll say is that people who are um, taking advantage of women and girls in places um, like South, Southeast Asia, where sex tourism is really prevalent, I would say, I don't know exactly the numbers or the percentage, but um, I would say almost 100% of the time, um, people who are taking advantage of, of those girls were consumers of pornography. It leads to um, actual actions. Um, so this is a huge, huge problem. I can't state it strongly enough um, that um, this is, if you wanna be a part of um, stopping the problem, that pornography is a really important place for that. Um, and also, you know, if that's not something that you are a part of, um, that being willing to talk about it and um, to not have that something that's okay in our society, it's really accepted as something um, that uh, many cultures just accept as, um, as okay, and it's not okay. And so um, this is a way that you can be a part of um, stopping this problem. Um, so I think I'm just about out of time. Um, I, I hope that this was informative for you. Um, this is something that is really dear to my heart um, as I've traveled the world. Um, so much of the world lives um, in very vulnerable situations. Um, and so helping people um, to live lives where they can thrive, where they can um, not have those, those things that push, push them out and um, make them do, as you saw in the video, things that they would never do otherwise. Um, giving people opportunities to work, um, to, to live healthy and safe lives is so important. And so no matter what uh, industry you end up going into in your life, I would encourage you to be a part of, um, you know, helping communities thrive, helping um, those who are vulnerable. Um, and so if you have any questions, um, either now or later, I would encourage you to reach out. I'm happy to answer those. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, um, Sarah, thank you for the informative lecture. And um, we do have some questions, but unfortunately, since we don't have time, I will quickly read um, just one of them. And it goes, what kind of impact did COVID-19 have on human trafficking? Yeah, so um, I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and I was reading just a little bit recently, um, since this is obviously new. Um, that it's uh, maybe in some ways been a, a blessing in the, in disguise kind of thing where um, even if it's just the, the sh um, I don't know, uh, cultural unwillingness of people to be close to one another, it's not actually accepted right now for people to be going into brothels and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, on the one hand, kind of in the fight against it, that's a good thing. Um, on the other hand, there is this unintended consequence of um, women who are already vulnerable. This was a way that they were maybe making a living. Um, you know, it's, I'm not saying that it's a good thing at all, but to have such a sudden abrupt um, change, I think has put women, many women into maybe other uh, very vulnerable situations um, to where maybe they can't, you know, uh, where they were already struggling and they were making very little money to maybe making no money, not able to support themselves and support um, their children. So uh, there's, you know, it's such a complicated thing that you can't just, can't just shut it down and expect people to be okay. Um, so that's a very short answer to a very complicated and good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we do not have any more time for other questions, but um, once again, Thank you, Sarah, for your time um, and giving us this lecture. And